More than 40 years ago, an initiative in Toronto's Bloor West Village became the first BIA, Business Improvement Area, in the world. The rest, as they say, is history, and BIAs can now be found around much of the world. Joining us now for more on their history and purpose, we welcome Rafael Gomez, Professor of Industrial Relations at the University of Toronto and co-author of Small Business and the City, and John Carew, Executive Director of the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. What do you call it? Tabia? Tabia it is. That's the acronym. Okay. Good to have you here for the first time. Nice to see you again. You were just here about nine days ago, so <laughs> welcome back. Thanks. John, I want to start with you. If you wander around this capital city of Ontario, you will see banners saying, Welcome to Greek Town. You will see that you're in the annex. You will say Corso Italia. You will see beautiful planter boxes on Young Street. Who put all of those things there? It's, in fact, the local small business people and property owners. Uh, the membership is made up of actually property owners and business operators. Uh, people that have dug deeper into their pockets above and beyond the taxes that we pay to all different levels of government. Uh, a levy, an annual levy that they transform into exactly that. Beautify, clean up and put on events and festivals. That is the parameters of the BIA concept. More on those levies in a second. I suspect the assumption is the city puts them up. City Hall pays for them, City Hall designs them, City Hall puts them up. Not the case. Aren't we the ultimate private-public partnership for this city? <laughs> uh, absolutely, it's not the case. Uh, most of these are uh, put up by the local business people. Uh, we do have a relationship with the city where on capital improvements, they do a capital cost share, mm -hmm. but the ongoing maintenance and repair is 100% the responsibility of the local BIA. And you design them as well? We design them. We, we have assistance, obviously, uh, through city design, a public realm. There's restrictions and, and guidelines that we need to follow. Uh, so we do uh, work with the city very closely. They have uh, to sign off on these uh, things? They absolutely do. Ultimately, mm -hmm. BIAs or agencies of the municipality and such, uh, there is some uh, rules of engagement, if you will, that we have to follow in order to uh, animate and maintain the streets of Toronto. So that's some of what you do. What would you describe, though, as the BIA's core functions? Uh, huh. It's uh, core function truly is, and it's a legislative function, uh, and it is to, uh, to beautify, uh, clean, maintain, make safe, uh, as well as to promote, ultimately, the promotion. Uh, there is three phases in the BIA life, if you will. Uh, the beautification. Once you beautify, you want to show it off. So what you do is you put on festivals to invite people to come and enjoy uh, the hard work that you've done in terms of cleaning, maintaining, and beautifying. And then phase three becomes really a retail mix strategy uh, where you move beyond festivals and events and you try to make it a destination on a daily basis rather than through a festival. And one more question before I got Raphael in here and that is you said make safe, make the neighborhood safe. I mean, you're not doing your own policing, right? But no, we're not. What does that in, mean then? Yeah, no, not in, a, not in the strictest of contact, uh, but uh, introducing additional street lighting. Uh, some of the pedestrian lighting that you see out there makes for a much brighter sidewalk. And you pay for feel. that stuff? We pay for that stuff. We pay for the hydro, we pay for the lanterns, we pay for all of that stuff. Uh, removing uh, graffiti, the perception when there's graffiti on buildings, uh, on, on, you know, on properties, uh, there is a perception of it being unsafe. So by getting on it as a BIA very quickly, it provides that comfort factor. Uh, so those are sort of the safe initiatives. Rafael, you wrote the book on this, so right. give us some of the background here. How did all of this come to be in the first place? Yeah, sure. I, I, I would say I wouldn't quite write the book. The, the book is about the people who wrote the book on BIAs, people like Alex Ling. I just want to mention him because uh, the story starts in 1966 in Toronto. Here's the, the, I think we have yeah. a picture of him with former Mayor G, uh, Jim yeah. Rowlands right oh, there. Oh, that's a great picture. Mm -hmm. And that storefront is exactly the same. It's immaculate. It's like a timepiece. Whereabouts is it? Um, Blue and Runnymede. Yeah. West End of Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, Blue West Village. Okay. So people like Alex Ling, why were yeah. they important? Well, uh, in 1966, uh, an important phenomenon occurred. The subway extension uh, went east and west, east to Woodbine, I think, and west to Keele. Before that, there was a streetcar that went above Bloor Street. Mm -hmm. And streetcars were very good for the small businesses at the time because there were frequent stops. You could see the storefronts. And so that was something that affected those businesses on Bloor Street West, where Alex was located um, a lot. But when you say affected, you mean negatively affected negatively. because all the people are going underground yeah, now? Yeah, and the stops okay. are farther apart. And then a second event, which happened almost two years to the day of the opening of the subway, in February 
1964 was the opening of Yorkdale. First shopping mall. Shopping mall. Northwest end of the city. First shopping mall uh, of the kind that we've come accustomed to in Canada. And those two events pulled a lot of shoppers away from the traditional Main Street. They got used to driving farther to get their amenities, and the businesses started to feel it. Now, what Alex did, there was a voluntary business association. You might say, well, what's new about BIAs? I don't understand. 40 years ago, businesses came together, and this is an innovation? Yes, because prior to that, everything was on a voluntary basis. A group of businesses might want to come together to promote the area. But we know when things are voluntary, you are subject to a very bad economic problem, the free rider problem, right. and not enough people pay into it. Alex's genius was to say, we have to harness together and compel people, although we'll do it democratically, we'll vote on it, but once you vote, you've got to pay in. Nobody's a free rider. And once everyone started paying, and once every business on that street started to realize they're not competitors, but they're actually common to that area and they have a common stake in everything, that the, the whole streetscape turned around and it became a destination. Not long after Alex compelled both his business owners to get on board, but then local government, but then provincial government, so it took a lot of actors to get this idea of mandating a tax, a voluntary tax. This, this mantra we have that small business are reactionary and want lower taxes that you might hear from some spokespeople for business. I won't name them, but this is the mantra you hear. It's not true. You're talking about the Canadian Federation of I Independent didn't say Business. That. Yeah, no, you, you said that. I'm reading between the lines, but that's what you mean, right? Yeah, the contra constant mantra that suddenly we need less investment, less taxes. This is not the case. Businesses in that area realized what had happened we needed more investment in our streetscape, and we needed to attract customers. So that, that's why it's so important, I think, to tell let's that story. Do, let's do a couple other names here as well. You mentioned yeah. Alex Ling. How about Neil McLennan? What was the significance of him in the development of this? They were both on the strip, and I think together they were uh, able um, to rally business owners who were very skeptical. So there's, McC uh, there's McClellan Jewelers. That's it. Another classic storefront, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. And John might he, know was, he was the first president, actually, of the BIA. He was uh, one of the major cogs in, in moving forward. Uh, Alex prides himself in saying, uh, I was more the incubator. Mm. Because as you can imagine, this innovative, uh, challenging, uh, taxing power was out there. And a number of people took opportunities to take lawsuits and, and against it, etc. So where, where Alex prides himself is that he was actually the one that helped nurse it through those trying years. Uh, but Mr. McClellan is one of, uh, one of a couple, and I believe you've got another name on your list. Yeah, Bill you're... Whiteacre? Yeah, William Whiteacre QC. He, uh, in fact, uh, is the, uh, and, and there they are, actually. Now, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's Mr. Whiteacre in the middle, Yeah, and that's Alex Ling on the right? That's correct. And I'm guessing that's, uh, that's Bob Bundy, right? <laughs> Used Bob? to be, um, Oh, what was it? Was he planning commissioner in Toronto about yeah. like 30, 40 years That's ago, right, something exactly. like that? Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He saw a bunch of that progress through. So William uh, Whitaker was the one that actually wrote the, uh, the piece of legislation. Mm. He's the one that took it and, and, and took it through the process. Uh, Mayor Dennison at that time uh, took the file and uh, he, quoting, unquoting, uh, he said to William Whitaker, you mean small business, local business people want me to tax them more. <laughs> and, uh, and effectively, that is the, the kernel of the idea behind uh, BIAs. Well, let's get into that. How do you know who pays how much tax, to whom, when? I mean, there's got to be a lot of complication underneath all of this. I'll, how does that all get resolved? I'll set it out in principle, and then uh, John can give you the detail. Sure. So the BIA levy, one of the reasons and this is, an, this is interesting in terms of taxation and what we could tolerate as a society. We have to invest in public goods. When you live in an urban environment, things depreciate. And if you're not investing, you're actually losing and falling behind. The BIA levy works, I think, in principle because the money goes right back to the business owners. There's no slicing off. Every, lev every piece of, 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 of money that goes into a business improvement area gets plowed back into the BIA itself. And it chooses what to invest in and what to use the money for. So it's a democratic process, and they have a hold on the money. Let me just understand but, that. A democratic yeah. process, meaning yeah. all the owners show up at a meeting and well, to in, show a hands, in, or what? In theory, yes. There's general uh, members' meetings. The votes have to happen. Nothing happens in a closed-door uh, environment. Again, these are kind of extensions of city uh, governance, so you, you have to have public meetings, and you have to have uh, votes on substantive issues about budgeting. But uh, John can tell you more particularly about how the levy is financed. 
Yep. And, and effectively, the BIA is a geographic area, a designated geographic area through a municipal bylaw. Uh, it is, uh, there's an election. People have to vote a BIA in. Uh, there is a poll that's done by the municipality. Uh, assuming everything meets the criteria of that poll and the BIA is established, a geographic area is set forth. Uh, we know what the assessment of that and commercial assessment, commercial industrial assessment of that area is in whole. And if your property uh, represent one one thousandth of that total assessment, you pay one one thousandth of the pre prescribed uh, levy that's uh, collected for that year. Uh, the uh, bill, the billing, if you will, comes in your tax bill uh, as a part of your uh, business tax, and it is the landlord, the property owner, that actually gets the bill because we no longer have business occupancy tax. Prior to 98, when there was a business occupancy tax, the BIA levy would be charged directly to the business. However, since the change of that legislation, uh, it now goes to the property owner, and the property owner has every right within the, uh, with the legal parameters to pass it down to his tenants. Hmm. How many BIAs in Toronto? 81. 81. And are they in basically every city in the province? Uh, basically every city, every town, etc. There's over 300 across the province of Ontario, some 700 across Canada. Uh, about 1,500 bids, as they're referred to in the U.S., mm -hmm. business improvement districts, and it goes worldwide. Really, the, the kernel of an idea that was established in Blue West Village is, in fact, Toronto's best export. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, Rafael, mm -hmm. that it's caught on so much? Well, I think a variety of reasons. Initially, I was trying to track the diffusion of BIAs in, when I was doing my research for the book, and the diffusion rate was pretty fast. Uh, for the time. I mean, St. Petersburg, Florida was one of the first jurisdictions to pick it up after <coughs> Blue West Village did. And apparently I'd found out it was because on, then Ontario and Florida were doing a lot of interministerial um, work together. Hmm. They were both growing very fast. The Florida was a state growing very fast. Ontario was a province growing very fast. And back then the Davis government and the Tories were, were collaborating. So that somehow that idea from Toronto migrated to St. Petersburg, Florida. I, I think it's because Mr. Davis liked to spend, spend his winters time. in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> as Whatever. he still does, but anyway. Whatever. So, so <laughs> it, 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 it worked well in cities that had established main streets that were still destinations, but we're seeing that business traffic erode. And then later, it moved to places that you would think unexpectedly would never take advantage of, like a suburb strip mall, for mm -hmm. example. But again, the issues were the same. The strip malls benefited at a time when the suburbs, in the inner suburbs of Toronto, were growing very fast. But by the late 80s, early 90s, that had stopped. And the growth was happening outside of the, of the 416. And those malls now started to suffer. Those early malls that were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Well, guess what? BIA, which had worked in small urban environments, or more dense urban environments, suddenly was expanded. Uh, to include, you know, beautification for a series of strip malls over a much wider footprint. So if you look at um, one of the BIAs that's in Scarborough, uh, Kennedy Road BIA, it spans probably what would be f two or three or four BIAs in the central core along Bloor, but it's one BIA. And, it, and it's a destination for people who want furniture or who want uh, computers or some ethnic dining. You have it all in this very long strip of Kennedy Road in East Scarborough. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for setting the table, you two. Sit tight, because we're going to have a couple of other guests join us in just a second. Before we do that, take a look at this information as we talk about BIAs starting in Ontario's capital city and branching out to the rest of the world. Right back after this. Okay, we're going to broaden the discussion now and examine the potential of small business as a transformative force for cities. And joining us to do that, Adriana Beemans. She is director of the Metcalf Foundation's Inclusive Local Economies Program, that's her on the left, and Cindy Rotenberg-Walker, partner at Urban Strategies. And we welcome back Rafael Gomez from the U of T and John Carew from TABIA, the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. Thank you for coming in and joining our conversation. Okay, Cindy, to you first. 
uh, how much do you sign on to the notion that if it's good for the BIA, it's good for the neighborhood, it's therefore good for the city, it's therefore good for the et cetera, et cetera? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I don't think uh, nothing is absolute, but uh, certainly there's a really interesting role that BIAs play in communities, which is, I think, growing, actually. As the city, as we can see, every time we walk outside the door, we're completely transforming our traditional main streets, turning them into much denser residential communities. BIAs are the center of that. It's really where the public life happens, you know, on the commercial street. And uh, so lots to offer in terms of the strength that they bring to our communities. Adriana, what do you say? Uh, I think BIAs are extremely important for a vibrant neighborhood, and I think there's a lot of other exciting small-scale innovations that are happening at a local level, both in animating community spaces and public realms and in transforming private spaces into more engaging public spaces. Why do you think we should be paying, if you think we should be paying, more attention to the role that Main Street businesses play in transforming cities? Well. I mean, I think small businesses and Main Street businesses are crucial local anchors for vibrant life. People live locally, shop locally. It's an area of inclusion. It's where you have piece of, people of all income levels to interact. So it's a really key part of the city fabric of the kind of city that we want to be. Cindy, does size matter here? Size does matter, and actually I'm glad you asked that because it's one of the interesting things that I think is a bit of a challenge to the traditional BIA model on a main street as being the only model for success because as I started, you know, we're transforming our main streets, intensifying them, building much more residential. That has to happen by a bigger entity. A BIA can't make that happen. That's a private development kind of organization that brings a public agenda to create these more complete and walkable communities um, forward. So really what I'm interested in is what's the role of small business in that future delivered urban fabric in terms of how it can be a partner in keeping the success of what works as a sort of fine-grained small size, you know, regular repeating format of frontages, but to have that be something that is not disappearing as we start to change the character and build new buildings, which are inherently more expensive and more challenging. It's interesting you say disappearing because, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that everybody was forecasting that the big box stores were going to come into these neighborhoods, they were going to mm -hmm. wipe out all of these mom and pop yeah. operations, and that would be the end of a particular way right. of life, a way of designing cities, and so on and so forth. That hasn't really happened. I think it's a spectrum. And actually, a lot of it is policy. A lot of it is because it's not possible to build a completely normal big box on an urban main street. There are controls in terms of the size of both the footprint of the store and also the way that it relates to the street. But big boxes are responding to and becoming a little more urban in their nature. And that's appropriate, actually, because I think you need, it's like everything. It's an ecosystem. It has to be able to offer the startup opportunities that Adriana was talking about. It has to be able to find something that's financially profitable so that it can be delivered. Communities will talk about the need and want to be able to shop in really locally generated businesses. But at the same time, they want the variety that a drugstore offers or the kind of new urban format grocery stores that are coming forward. So, so I think all of it works as long as it can find a balance, and that's really the key. And that's, that's, that's I think, our challenge. Hmm. Adriana, was that a, a phase where everybody worried that the big box store was going to wipe out mom and pop? Uh, I think it's still a phase. Uh, so we're not out of it yet? Uh, I don't think we're out of it. I think that part of that is, you know, when you look at uh, big box stores coming in and becoming more boutique stores, there's still, the, what's that impact on uh, small scale entrepreneurs? And so I think that's still a key concern for many. Rafael, what do you think? I think one of the things you have to distinguish is a large urban city like Toronto can tolerate the diversity. You, you probably want that mix of a large box store somewhere that was old industrial land that now had no other purpose and the, sm the main streets where people can go. It's in the intermediate areas, a smaller city, where a big box store can have a devastating effect uh, because you don't have the density, you don't have the amount of people that could make different choices. And the box store could just wipe out all the small business. And it's not like, oh, the jobs now have gone to big box stores and they've left small business. Overall, net job growth is lower in those communities when a big box store destroys indigenous entrepreneurial activity. Um, and the second thing I would say is that uh, just getting back to this idea, like we take it for granted because now our city really transformed the last 20 years. These sort of intensification of urban living, the condos and the businesses that are set up around it. If you go back 30, 40 years, what, what Alex Ling and those business owners did was quite radical. The view of the city was quite different, segmented usage. Here's where you live, 
here's where you will work, here's where you will shop, and it was all disaggregated and segregated from each other. You know, it was the Spadina Expressway that was going to come through and clean up these neighborhoods that needed cleaning up because they were old and ratty and, you know, we needed to do something modern. And, you know, Jane Jacobs and those efforts put a stop to that and we realized those were the neighborhoods that cities thrive on. And it's a pretty radical thing that we don't take as radical now. You know, to yeah. save and preserve those small spaces for new immigrants who come to Canada, that's usually the place they find their first job is when they create it. So, just wanted to add that little piece to the, to the story. The city, the city has clearly become the city of neighborhoods, and, and whether it's the ethnic uh, background that's cultured at or uh, the geography that's, uh, that's created it. But the important thing is BIAs are, in fact, the living rooms, the dining rooms, and the kitchens of all those condo dwellers out there. 182 construction cranes out in the air, I think, is the last report mm -hmm. uh, that's out there. Six, 700 square hey, uh, foot condos. Dwell on that for a second. 182 cranes in the skies in Toronto alone. That's right. Building new whatever, condos, yeah. office buildings, whatever. 182. That's right. Is that, that's got to be number one or number two in North America. I, I believe it is. Uh, I believe uh, New York, LA, Dallas, mm -hmm. and Chicago combined don't have that many up at the moment. Huh. Uh, I think Asia certainly surpasses us, uh, some of the larger cities there. But we are, we are absolutely experiencing a boom and you know, the real estate bubbles and all that stuff, that's a topic for another day. Uh, but the reality is people are moving into the city uh, and uh, these people, uh, many of European descent, are looking to live the way they lived back in Europe. where. The streets are, the piazzas are, the gathering places, and literally the, the developments that have happened out there, six, seven, eight hundred square foot uh, condos, they mm. desire, they need that extra space. And it is our patios, it is the stores mm -hmm. that are the gathering places. Man is naturally a social animal, and we need that interaction. And that's what we as BIAs provide on the streets of Toronto. So Cindy, how yeah. much do you mm -hmm. think small business can actually transform an area? Oh, absolutely. I think yeah, um, John's mentioned the fact that it creates identity. People really want to be associated with neighborhoods that have identity. It's this, I think it's an, fascinating. We know we're busy um, kind of promoting digital community, but at the same time, people want that really physical connection. And so anything that can make you feel part of something is really important. And I think that's something that our BIAs in Toronto in particular are really successful, this idea of the neighborhood. Um, I think it's, it's uh, I, I guess the, the question will be what will be the next generation of the, the role that these um, communities can play to serve not just our immigrant population, which is a phenomenal part of Toronto's success, but millennial uh, desires, which are completely different. And so I think some of the things that Raphael was talking about that, you know, my kids have not got driver's licenses. I can't get them to get their driver's license. I think that's... They don't not, need a car. They don't need a car. It's not unusual. They don't actually see that as part of their mm -hmm. future. And I think that is an amazing thing to promote this kind of walkable community set of objectives that we're striving to, uh, to accomplish. That does yeah. say a lot, doesn't it? Because I know, I, I bet you everybody at this table, the day they turned 16, yeah. went out and got their driver's absolutely. license. Yes, yeah. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. You don't have your license yet? <laughs> no. Yeah, you're a millennial. <laughs> no, I'm not a millennial. <laughs> no? no I, just, I age well. <laughs> Not a, I okay, don't have you'd be the exception of the rule, because mm -hmm. nowadays, I, I agree, Absolutely. there's no rush yeah. anymore mm -hmm. if yeah. you live in the city like this. How yeah. about, I mean, most of the, kind, most of the PR we hear mm -hmm. in Toronto, certainly these days, are these new 80-story you know, condominiums that are going up at Young and Bloor. They're very big construction projects that have the ability to, um, you know, to completely uh, transform a neighborhood. People don't necessarily think that that's something that small business does as well. But do they? Do small businesses really transform neighborhoods in a way that an 80-story condo and whatever comes around it can as well? Well, I think for, for sure, but I also think it's important to recognize that Toronto has multiple neighborhoods and some research shows we have like various cities in one city and so who lives and works in one neighborhood uh, is very different in other pockets and other suburbs of the neighborhood. So one of the things that I think the, the work that we're focusing on is how do we make uh, small, reduce the barriers for micro entrepreneurship and small scale so that more low income individuals can enter the, the micro entrepreneurship world and enter 
downturn small scale business. We also see that while we're describing neighborhoods and main streets that a lot of these tower communities in the outer suburbs don't have active BIAs and they don't have an active main street. They live in pockets. And so the question is what can we do to revitalize those tower communities that have small towns living in, you know, three what to four what do you call them? tower, tower communities? communities. What does that mean? So, um, I mean, if you think about downtown, you have St. Jamestown, which is a huge set of towers, but out in Thorncliffe Park, in that neighborhood, you have over 35 towers. 30,000 people live mostly all in huge apartment towers. That's in Premier Wynn's riding. That's in Premier mm -hmm. Wynn's yeah. riding. And one of the things the city is working on is uh, we've changed the zoning to work on resident apartment commercial zoning so we can have mm -hmm. support small scale commercial and community mm -hmm. use on the main floor of some of these private apartment buildings because I think that's part of the challenge on if you don't have main streets, where is the role for small business? Where is the opportunity for people who want to set up shop and they, there's a lot of uh, financial barriers perhaps Perhaps on a main street or cultural and social barriers to go outside of your neighborhood. So we have to think new ways. In which case, Cindy, yeah. do you ever worry that BIAs are leading the way in some neighborhoods at the expense of other neighborhoods that don't have them? Um, I don't think so necessarily. I think that it's, I think exactly as Adriana has pointed to, that we have a whole series of ways now that we're trying to get at these shared objectives. So you know, these informal community kind of organizations. You know, it, part of, it's not just business, but it's also the public realm. Raphael's book talked about a lot of things I thought was really important in terms of just the beauty of our cities. And that is one thing that BIAs contribute to. But there are other ways that you can try to make sure that you're actually doing things that improve quality of life. And that's actually fundamental. So, so I don't think it's all about BIAs. It's always about a shared set of interests that a whole variety of players, large and small, can bring forward. You know, a big role of it is the public sector um, at all levels of government, but also private enterprise. You know, my Micro, mm -hmm. mini, and uh, and macro. Okay, and where but the BIAs, yeah. where the BIAs come into play on this thing is that we bring our money to the table. Right. We're not, yep. you know, uh, the days of waiting for the local government to do things for us went way the way of the exactly. dodo were back in the yeah. 70s, yep. and, and the BIAs are that model. Uh, this year alone, BIAs are levying themselves. Toronto BIAs, the 81 BIAs, uh, 34 million dollars. Yep. $34 million above and beyond the taxes that we're paying to invest in city infrastructure, in, yep. into city you know, well-being. Uh, and, and you know, we learned very quickly, uh, and, and the message we try to get out is, how Main Street goes, so goes the rest of the neighborhood. That's right. Safe, vibrant Main Street absolutely increases the assessed value okay. of properties that are immediately around But there. Raphael, it yeah. does raise a question. If, if you're one of those neighborhoods where you've got yeah. a good, strong small business community sure. that's prepared to pay the levies yeah. and make the beautification that you've talked about, John, yeah. Great, yeah. but if you don't, if you're yeah. in a low income, what they call, I guess, priority neighborhoods mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. and you don't have these assets, yeah. are you screwed? Well, uh, no, but you, you can learn from the BIA movement and the Metcalf Foundation's work in this area on building local resilience. So you think of the small business, you almost think, oh, that's the bottom of the totem pole and you want to aspire to a big chain and then become a big box realtor. But no, it's the other way around. Oh, right, you right. have micro entrepreneurs that have businesses in their basements or in their kitchens that aspire to the small shop on the main street. And you can, if you have spaces like uh, we were just mentioned, either in sort of parking lots or school fronts that aren't used on weekends where you can set up markets for these micro entrepreneurs that are building up to maybe owning a shop on the main street, you need the ecology view of the city and the business environment. So you can take cues from the BIA movement in which coming together, pooling resources, gives you more voice. And you do that at a more smaller level, micro level. And of course, then the next step is how do you make a business that's been successful in one neighborhood perhaps migrate to another? How do you give them the skills, the capital that would allow them to become a small chain in a big city? And research has shown local independent chain, so a chain but that's based locally, is by far the biggest employer mm -hmm. of local uh, citizens mm -hmm. and local um, uh, workers. It is the case, though, Adriana, that some people in, in any city are hostile to business, and they think that the interests of business are not synonymous with the interests of the average citizen. Uh, is there a part of you that is concerned that uh, business's voice in this transformation is too loud at the expense of the average citizen? Uh, no, I think that's a very narrow approach to what a business is. I think there's a lot of heterogeneity of businesses. I think uh, independent, local, uh, small, those are all key values. I mean, small businesses are key employers. Uh, so for me, I, I think they're really crucial components if we're talking about 
paying people living wages, the role that small businesses have in doing that and being high performing workplaces. Uh, they're a crucial component, not just as the businesses themselves, but as employers. And in building social capital in low income neighborhoods, when you kind of say to a young person, like, go and find a job, uh, you know, go pass out your resume, it's the small businesses they go to. Those are the people that they know in their neighborhood. That's where they buy their milk, that's where they buy their newspapers or uh, get their haircuts and get their nails done. I mean, it's the small businesses that provide the social capital that help on all levels from employment to micro entrepreneurship. They're really crucial yeah. components. Well, well, sorry, I, I didn't mean to, but I, want, I didn't want to forget my, my point. <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> but in, in my research around the city, one of the things I, I identified was the local mayor, the true local mayor. Every neighborhood has a, a, a local mayor, and it's sometimes the barbershop owner, sometimes it's the uh, grocery owner, sometimes it's the convenience store owner. The person that's been there a long time, knows every resident, and somehow is the sort of hub for a whole bunch of transactions and information flows, uh, or it's the restaurant, the cafe. And these local mayors um, distribute information and channel that information often to the local councillor or to the MP. Uh, it's a vital role. I think at the small scale, that alienation that people feel towards what you said, business, is really, it's an alienation towards large structures. You know, this is the E.F. Schumacher, small is beautiful, the, the idea of of, of things being smaller, they're more human at the same time. So it's not a really question of its business against it's scale. interest. It's scale, yeah, for That's sure. It's also a partnership, I think, too, though. Yeah. Like I've, there's two really interesting projects that we're involved with, one just by one of my partners from a neighborhood perspective, but in the Roncesville BIA. So West there, end of Toronto. Yeah, West End of Toronto, just uh, east of High Park. So there, the BIA had a desire to improve the quality of the public realm, the beauty of Roncesvalles, mm -hmm. yeah. and tried, but was not able to kind of carry it forward. And then the resident associations, I think three separate resident associations, came in partnership with the BIA. And so that's where the success was. It's complete. I think everybody finds it to be an amazing example. What did they do? So they completely redid the, there was an opportunity being driven by replacement of the streetcar tracks, but completely refurbished the street, turned more of it over to sidewalks, so narrowed the travel way for our cars, it's a much more cycle friendly environment now. But that's only possible because the BIA had the idea or the need. Um, you know, I don't know the details, but maybe it was an economically driven consideration. The community shared that need, and together they were able to come forward with a solution. And they but have I great street festivals out there absolutely. too. Absolutely. The yeah, really and again, wonderful. that's the role of as the centerpiece of the community. I think John said it really well: kitchens, dining mm -hmm. rooms, front porch, you know, all of that. But it can happen at a bigger scale too. I really do think that. Um, I think our worldview will change about the role that business can play in delivering what we've conventionally or at least historically thought about as public benefit. You know, things like I'm very involved with a group in Liberty Village that are developing a, a proposal called the King High Line, which the idea is to bridge across four different communities. Um, which would be beneficial for all of the BIAs in that area so that they would have this kind of common set of neighborhood um, trade area that would then be able to travel freely through the neighborhood. So that's the kind of thing that it can happen if people understand that everybody can bring something different to the table. And that's really where I think we have to be and able and to. Back to Raphael's yeah. point, really, you do need a local champion. You can't will a BIA. We've had many cases where councillors have said, we want to establish a BIA mm -hmm. here. You can't do it without those champions, those identified leaders, a handful one sometimes. And, and, and really, the expansion has been uh, that a local business person has gone through some of those festivals you alluded to, Steve, in, in, in Ronsi or Blue West Village with the Ukrainian festival. Say, Why can't we do that in our neighborhood? And he'll go back and realize that by getting together, there is a legislation, piece of legislation that allows you to collectively work together to establish those goals. You do have to work with the city, though, to some uh, extent, right? Absolutely. I know right, outs right outside the doors of the studio uh, in the summertime, a young in Eglinton in the middle of Toronto, mm -hmm. they shut down That's one of the major thoroughfares mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. town uh, for blocks yeah. and uh, play music and people dance mm -hmm. in the streets, and it's That's a wonderful true. thing. But you've got to have the city on side to do that, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's been one of the successes of amalgamation. There haven't been many. But I'd say <laughs> economic, no, they haven't. I mean, the amalgamation, I think, has been awful for the reasons we just talked about, scale, the alienation people feel mm -hmm. from different parts of the city. But one area that's really been, I think, key was economic development. And uh, the support they've given communities that want to set up EIs has been enormous. So we've got a great uh, economic development team, I think, in the city. And uh, you can look at the chart, I think, in the, in the book, but the growth of EIs has just uh, sort of hockey sticked, you know, the old uh, mm -hmm. Al Gore thing about well, the global warming, but it's a hockey stick. Look, it looks like we had 10 EIs just in the last year. 
Um, so I think people are learning the ideas diffusing to more neighborhoods. And your point about the neighborhoods that are being left out, I think those were intrinsically harder to organize. But as the be perceived benefits keep getting higher and higher, maybe those neighborhoods will be the next uh, to organize. Too. Adriana, let me give you the last 30 oh, seconds here. Do you think that uh, official Toronto, and by that I guess I mean City Hall, the politicians, the bureaucracy, do they have something to learn from the example set by the BIAs and this kind of neighborhood partnership? I think there's a lot to learn from innovation, from local small scale, from partnerships, public and private uh, folks together. And I think that the, the city, we see lots of promising things from looking at zoning, development, incubators, that they want to be a willing partner for the vibrancy of our economic well-being for the city. Terrific. Thanks, everybody, for participating tonight. Rafael Gomez, the uh, professor of industrial relations at the U of T. We recommend his book, Small Business and the City. Adriana Beemans, the director of the Metcalf Foundation's Inclusive Local Economies Program. John Carew, executive director of TABIA, the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. Cindy Rotenberg Walker, partner with Urban Strategies. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.